if you know something about the stock market, you don't want to share that information. You want to keep that secret into yourself. I've heard that before, right? Like it, the stocks you're buying, you might not want to tell me what they are. You want to keep that for yourself. I've, I've got that from more than one person. I'm okay. Like, no, like I'll tell you what I own. I don't care. But they, there's like this, oh, there must be some mystery behind it. Or like, you don't want to tell me what you own, do you? What? Well, people are pretty cagey with their finances, finances in general, I would think. But I, there's having a position of knowledge that's secretive is more, I'd say, more fun than anything. Or just like, hey, I know something you don't know. But sharing it and then seeing, for me, sharing that and seeing someone win as well, like, mm -hmm. I like that. Alrighty, well, it is time for the True Well Show on this, the best Tuesday you've had all week, and we have got a fun show today where I've got guests in studio, we've got, of course, my main man with me as always, Matt Dixon, and we've got my, well, my, my kid brother who's going to join me, he has been shanghai but I have it on good authority, he'll be joining us in studio shortly. Uh, we've got some fun to talk about today, Matt, uh, you just posited this as an idea and i thought and i did it like I, 10 seconds ago before the radio right. show and we're this well prepared for it by the way oh yeah actually i've only spent what 24 years prepping for this particular show you so. have been preparing your whole life for this moment david <laughs> awesome we got this so what is it what what do we want to call this i feel like i mean you you said like conspiracy theories yeah, that's but what it's I like was, that's what i was looking it's for it's like the controversial yeah. theories of the market and i think these are fun to like investors debate these like is this real or not <laughs> okay yeah and so uh, some of this will be academic and some of it will just be a real chance to throw some smack and some shade at the market. And I'm good with that. Okay. So, hey, Scott, welcome to the studio. Hey, thanks for having me in this beautiful studio. <laughs> <Love>. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to talk about a few things. Okay. Some of them I'm going to actually have to revisit. But uh, a, a few theories that float around in the markets, we may not get to all of them. The first one, um, I'm just going to name a few, right? Yeah. The efficient market hypothesis. All right. Okay. There's, oh, I know that one. The, yep. Okay. The 50% principle. Okay. Uh, the greater fool theory. One of my favorites, by the way. The odd lot theory. Prospect theory. The oh, I got to give Scott's mic. Hey, thanks for the heads up. He's hot now. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I like introducing him and his mic's not on like oh that's what you get uh hey learn to work the the soundboard dave well we're not used to three people in studio normally it's only two it's well, true so, so welcome what a blessing to have me here right uh yeah the day just, just keeps getting on. better yeah. keeps getting better it's the best tuesday i've had all week so, well, me too. It's yeah. weird how that works. It happens like all the time. I got my tacos today, so you know I'm ready to go. Yeah, <laughs> Matt and his tacos. That is, awesome. if you're not following Taco Tuesday, something's wrong with you. Right. Matt occasionally gives free promos to local restaurants because they uh, their taco game is strong and he yep. can't resist. Thanks, maybe Smoking Fridays. Hey, if Matt shows up and wants tacos, maybe uh, show him a little love. It's the best $2 taco in town. There you go. So <laughs> anyway, I, the efficient market hypothesis, one of my favorite things to talk about, believe it or not. Okay. Is it really? So, Why? But yeah, it sounds nerdy, it, but like it's this is a this is an interesting theory, and uh, so yeah, Warren it, Buffett opposes this theory, doesn't so he? So Warren Buffett's not big into the efficient market hypothesis. Why? No, I don't know why. I don't know the why behind that. So I just know that he does. Like let's it. first talk a little bit about what the heck it means, because a bunch of our listeners are like, "Rude, efficient market hypothesis." What? <laughs> All right, it starts with this as a concept. Everything that's known about a stock is reflected in its current price. That's the theory. Okay. Now, what it means is all of the news, everything has been baked into the price in that moment. New information may come out a moment later, at which point the price can change, but everything that's possible to know about it is already priced in. That's where we get the insider trading type stuff. Well, that's where therein well, lies the yeah. issue, right? Insider trading, part of why it's illegal. It's because you're trading on information that can't be known by everybody, so it's not fair. That's why you see a lot of – some executives will make a end-of-day trade – sometimes mm -hmm. well it's why you might see there are literally services that are devoted to tracking the trades of politicians 
right? Well, and you, you can, can track yeah. the trades that Nancy Pelosi makes. Well, you can also look at you know people who own parts of the company, how they're trading inside the company that they work that for. That is true. So, and that's because of reporting kind of requirements. The yeah. Ownership has restrictions on how they sell or buy stock. Right. Right. And so it's supposed to be publicly disclosed. And it's interesting. I've not seen tons of data that suggests that how insiders buy or sell means a whole lot. Insider buying, what I've been told, actually has a better indication than insider selling. Because people sell for all kinds of goofy reasons. Right. Right. They could just but need to be buying, buying a bigger, yeah. bigger house in Vail. If you're buying, you feel pretty confident in the company that you're working at for various reasons. So that's probably a pretty good sign. Mm -hmm. Or you know, institutional type purchasing can have its way on where something might go or not go. Or yeah. So if, if, if we're getting into kind of interesting stuff, it'll, we'll dabble in some of the other components of this. It goes into are markets efficient or not? What I would suggest is... I think is, they've gotten more efficient. I think markets, are, it, it all depends on how you're going to measure, right? And we do not... Th so this is the part that's really interesting to me. I try to make this point often, which is we're not all playing the same game, right? We don't all have an agreement over what fair value is. Right. Because the day trader versus the buy and hold long term person that's a whole different their yeah. use case is different somebody may be somebody may not actually care about the fundamental valuation of a stock right mm -hmm. who cares if it's making money or not all i care about is are there more lemmings buying it than selling it right or vice versa because i'm going to get into the lemming scrum we talked about that right yeah and there's, just try to make money on the movement about like in a, there's also a, kind of an attachment uh that some people get to a stock by name just emotionally whether someone's looking at that or not. That, 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 that influences the why. Like yeah. the why do you buy or the why do you not buy, right? And so because that rhyme is better than why do you sell. Why do you not buy? Uh, yeah, money. <laughs> well, well, there are lots of reasons. Should have talked but to you. The idea that we all are playing the same game. We're not, right? We're not. Some people look at a stock and they want it to be really volatile because they're trying to buy options surrounding that mm -hmm. stock and trying to make money on the movement in the stock. Other people, the last thing they want is volatility. They hope that thing is steady, eddy, boring, go to sleep, wake up the next day and everything's the same. That's not the same game. No. Right? And so what happens is, and this is sort of my take on this theory, is that in the short term, markets are not necessarily efficient. Because there are exploitative things that occur in terms of the, the balance of supply and demand in the short term, which is why you can see like a big company like Google or Apple or Microsoft still move three, four, five percent a day sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, did the company change five percent? Like, if like if Apple stock goes down five percent, is the company five percent different, or did enough people in the trading? change yeah. the the who wanted to buy and who wanted to sell and it gets like even more pronounced on bigger extremes right because like kroger i think we watched kroger last year maybe the year before it jumped like literally 20 percent in a day right and we're like wait a minute did you guys make a lot more money on your groceries or did some sentiment change in well, a hurry or well, did a i mean this can happen yeah uh company gets added to the s p 500 Right. And you think, oh, wait, the stock sh price shoots up. And you go, well, why would that happen? S because a bunch of index funds have just to buy it. it. And so the supply of buyers just shot way up and the supply of sellers didn't, mm -hmm. which means the buyers had to pay more because they had to get it, that stock in because it's in the index now. So that created a different type of demand. Now, one again could argue. Everything that's known about the price of that or the, about that stock is now reflected in the price. It went up twenty percent. Well, it had to. You know what we just learned? There weren't enough sellers, and there were too many buyers. I think the information provided in the in the marketplace overall has a huge effect on this. I mean, if you look, DWAC stock yesterday went up over fifteen percent right before the New Hampshire primary is happening today. Oh, which if you look at as far as like coincidence with information. That's one of those things where you see that massive shift that you're talking about on the short term. Yeah, I would not argue on the long term for it, though. So I, I think that speaks to your point. Yeah, yeah, and, and that I think that it is speaking to the point that in the short term, and I'm talking about in the minutes 
hours or a few days at a time, maybe even a few weeks, the market is oftentimes seemingly quite inefficient or irrational, and it trades on rumors. And the other thing is we can still manipulate information, right? I mean, sentiment can be manipulated by things like social media and how algorithms promote or, or demote different postings. Key people say something. You know, when Elon Musk says something, markets move, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we used to talk about uh, it before Elon Musk, I mean, when Donald Trump, before he was kicked off Twitter, like he could say stuff and the markets would move. Absolutely. Well, you, you think back to the GameStop stuff. Yes. When that started going a certain direction, you saw a message flow from, call them whatever, the powers that be of mm-hmm. the media that were trying to direct a narrative at that point. Once the cat had kind of gotten out of the bag, yes. and a lot of these investors were in a different position than they certainly expected to be based on consumer behavior at the individual level. Right. Uh, now, what I could tell you is if you're trying to admit, tell me over five years, are markets efficient? I think they're pretty efficient. I, I think that I think that day to day activity sort of gets, as they'd say, worked out in the wash, hmm. right? So I think markets become efficient over time, which is why it is academically so encouraged. And it's when I say it's encouraged, it really is, because even the regulatory backdrop tends to err on the side of encouraging long term buying and holding. Right, our tax structure favors long term. It's a cheaper tax structure if you have long term holds. Retirement plans are designed for long term holds. Right, there's a lot of things that incentivize that behavior of longer term investment. And the studies play out that over time, it's very difficult to outperform indexes consistently over time. And so the markets look pretty efficient over time. Isn't and, that true for most people, but not Little John Financial? <laughs> <laughs> we we do not represent our shop as a performance shop, but what I can tell you, yeah, no, this, so this is so this is kind of fun. This is kind of fun. Let's talk a little bit about this. We're we're gonna run up on our first like time pressure, right? So we're gonna grab a break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about where the markets maybe aren't efficient and where it might matter to try to take advantage. And so we will share a little bit of philosophy about how we approach investing and how we view navigating the efficient market hypothesis. So we get into that. We get into that. But we got to take this, uh, you know, evil corporate profit break first. So let's do that. And we'll be right back. Stick around. I'm Dave Littlejohn. Matt Dixon. Scott Littlejohn. And you got True Wealth on News Radio 90s or 9 FM and 1240 KQEN. Um, here's my question to Scott and Matt. If the markets are, uh, if the theory is long term markets are efficient, but the short term markets are not, what are some of the things that cause short term market inefficiency? I think just some crazy news, right? We get these news cycles that come up and stuff goes crazy. And then five, six days later, it evens out and prices are back to normal. So you could get a news cycle that just has people panicking and fear. Fear can do weird things to pricing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, totally. I, I think the news cycle is probably the biggest factor on short term, in all honesty, because the information you have that you're working with is what impacts your immediate decision. And if you can be emotionally swayed, because you know, buying something and selling something is an emotional thing. And so if your emotions are stirred, which happens through either good or bad news, mm-hmm. that, that leads you to a decision portal that you may not have otherwise been affected by. You know, and so right. having it come from multiple news sources at the same time, you, know, you see it on this network and this newspaper and this article, that's that's a big factor in what your perception of the immediate market is. Once the herd starts moving. Yeah. yeah, which I'm sure is another term that there's got to, what's this lemming thing we're talking about? <laughs> that's an inter, that, so we joke about that, okay. right? Uh, you know, because of course lemmings, the, the, the old, you know, wives tale that they'll like all run off a cliff and they'll jump into the water because bunch of lemmings they're not paying attention it's just that's what everybody's doing right and so away the lemmings go and the scrum is a reference to rugby okay. right so the you know rugby is everybody piles together trying to grab the ball and it's just a big mess huh this looks like it hurt <laughs> i don't disagree <laughs> but uh, you know so the lemming scrum is this disorganized array of people that are sort of all going somewhere but they're not really sure where they're going and they're not even sure what they're fighting over but we just know that it's happening and it creates a, a sway in a market direction i know where they're going Okay. To the moon. <laughs> the whole thing right now. Did, you, you did we pull you out of a Reddit board somewhere? <laughs> exactly. It's just me. diamond hands. Come on. Come on. 
the the so I, I here's I think something to be aware of too. What news you get is very important. Yep. Okay, that uh, the news that you receive can influence your decisions, and so that is part of what plays into this too. Well, so it feels like our news keeps getting less and less credible. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I get this. so that's really that's easy. the dangerous part. It it it's is algorithm uh, control and what you look. Depending that's on you the get, thing, right? What yes. exactly? You what you want? Yeah. What, what is the want. algorithm going for? Right. And and originally the algorithm was it's just going for maximum eyeballs. Right. That mm-hmm. was the the initial. But then there's whether or not they're rumors or real. The idea that you have uh, government agencies that are security type agencies that have gotten involved and they have design influence. Maybe it's not even government. Maybe there are corporate interests that say we want certain things to occur. And so we control the flow of information that is seen or not seen. Okay. This was really big during COVID when you saw certain information was declared as misinformation or removed from platform or even getting people deplatformed. Only later it turns out it was true. Right. That that is that's an information manipulation. So I I do want to share a theory with you guys. Okay. My theory about the markets. Okay. Maybe you've heard me say this before. Is this Dave theory? This is a little bit of Dave theory. I like that. So Dave theory goes like this. Uh, First of all, over time, investing principles are relatively unchanged. The same way the principles behind something like war over time are unchanged. However, the tactics change a lot because the tools and technology change. So while investing in principle looks really similar, in practice, there are a lot of different tactics that are used today that are different than, say, 30, 40 years ago. Right, because 30 or 40 years ago, computers weren't trading for you. Correct. And 30, 40 years ago, you had an information advantage, right? You could know things that somebody else didn't know, and that could give you an advantage, Mm -hmm. which is why the stockbroker that was the the person that was like the beat reporter, right? They were the word on the street, and they knew stuff. They could get you an information advantage and they could sell you something that could ultimately benefit you. But that profession sort of changed irrevocably, right, with the democratization of information. Follow what I'm saying? Yeah. The the internet makes the news get out everywhere and it's basically free. We We don't have an information advantage anymore. You have to know how to filter information and get the good stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, I, it's so funny you mentioned this. I overheard a conversation today on just this thing. Oh, yeah. There's a couple of fellows who were talking about, uh, they both read the New York Times. Mm-hmm. And they enjoyed the actual physical New York Times because, as the one fellow said, there were some articles that at the time he was working, which was 30 years ago, you needed to read that in order to have a bead on what the industry was doing within that. The advertising page mattered. The mm-hmm. actual markets and stock page on the wall street journal matter that mm-hmm. because that's where you got your information from and while they you know really just reminisced about missing out on having a physical paper with a cup of coffee you know which was is kind of a nice thing to do still i, I believe but it 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 speaks to your point of the information source being at one place at one point and right. where we've changed to now as far as availability and the internet too many sources oh it, yeah it's well and separating the real from the not real because, mm-hmm. oh, if it's on the internet, it used to be that it was believed to be true. Anymore, if it's on the internet, it's almost questioning whether or not it can be real. Well, and you, you, everything's not true on the internet? I'm not telling you that. Really? But why did you say that? I, I thought it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you look at a lot of these major news platforms and you trace back, you know, who owns them. And that yeah. is the really scary thing because, I mean, don't quote me, but I think the Wall Street Journal – is now owned by a corporation out of China. I could be wrong. I'll fact check that and we'll come back. We to should it. probably fact check that. But, I haven't heard, but it doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah. Uh, the The issue here, when you come back to my point of tactics and information is information moves so fast now, right? Back in Roman times, right? The very term marathon comes from the fact that somebody had to run to to the town of Marathon with news about the results of awards. The guy runs for 27.6 miles or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but what Athens, Athens Marathon. and Marathon, right? Gets to the miles. end, says victory, keels over and dies, right? Mm-hmm. So he runs himself to death. But so, yeah, if you don't think you're running hard, try that. But 
the point is that was the speed of information was as fast as he could carry it. It traveled on in scrolls and on horseback. And then it was a big deal when we could start using telephones and telegraphs. And then the fax machine was a big deal. Today with the internet, we can distribute information globally in fractions of a second. Globally. Right. We can distribute communication to other planets if we needed to. Right. So we have a whole different way to move piles of information that didn't exist before. And what does it do? It changes the speed at which everything occurs. This, so my theory is that the markets and market cycles are faster than they used to be, and it's entirely because of the speed of information. Well, I would, you know, in making a <clears throat> quick decisions don't always tend to be the best ones. Um, hence, to, to lead to your long-term market overall being more consistent yeah. than the short-term. But well, the long term gives you the ability to absorb some of the short term mistakes because those tend to be worked out, which is why the principles are unchanged, right? A good investment is still a good investment. It can just have uh, silly news in the, in the middle of it, you know, like during your ownership phase. I'm going to own this thing for 20 years. And at three years in, I get some bad news and this, this, you know, the investment falls by 50%. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad investment. It, the worst thing is it usually means, great, well, my average cost is less attractive. And so my lifetime return is going to be impacted by this because it would have been better to have bought it cheaper and it got cheaper than when I bought it. But if it recovers and goes on new values that are higher, it still plays out over time in your benefit. But then you get into the strategies for how you manage money, right? I mean, managing mm -hmm. money is not necessarily passive. We talk about this all the time. I can love a company, but I, I don't fall in love with stocks because you stocks – Split aces and double down. Yes. Right? yes. <laughs> well, you know, remember, stocks are in the lemming scrum. So <laughs> <laughs> there, therein lies the issue. So sometimes you need to manage your position size a little bit, and you want to manage your tax disposition, at least in our opinion you do. Right? They say our. That's kind of a royal our because it's like really – in my opinion, and then I tell Matt, yeah. you have to do this. And Matt goes, I know, because he's <laughs> like, well, I mean, I would do it too, but whatever, Dave. <laughs> I've never said whatever to Dave in our entire lives. I've always respected this. <laughs> Every day. There's, there's <laughs> never been a time he's never. disagreed with me. <laughs> oh, oh, man. I do agree with you on this pretty heavily. I mean, it, it makes sense when you talk about it. the short term, the vulnerability with that versus the long term. It's. Yeah. Um, over time, if you look at the data, it, it's like an aircraft carrier versus a speedboat. You know, I mean, one turns much slower than the other, but it still keeps chugging forward. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to outlast that speedboat. And when the waters get rough, that boat has a much better chance of flipping and going under all the way than an aircraft carrier. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, good. We've declared that the markets um, uh, are not necessarily efficient in the short term. Over the long run, they become more efficient. Uh, so that go begs the next question: What, what are, are some, some other weird theories? things that people yeah. believe? What are some theory? What are th other theories we hear out there? Dogecoin is going to go to the moon. Okay, the to the moon theory. Yeah, that goes. The moon theory. Yeah, the Bitcoin's going to, or you know, all these cryptocurrencies are going to strong together. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm digging in my okay. Bucket here. This is big. All right. Well, I'm I'm I'm, I'm digging it so far. So there's one. Uh, what are some other theories that we can think of? Hmm. Or just maybe yeah. wives' tales about the market, well, I mean, right? I, oh, I know one. I get this one all the time. If you know something about the stock market, you don't want to share that information. You want to keep that secret into yourself. I've heard that before, right? Like it, the stocks you're buying, you might not want to tell me what they are. You want to keep that for yourself. I've, I've got that from more than one person. Okay. Like, no, like I'll tell you what I own. I don't care. But they, there's like this, oh, there must be some mystery behind it. Or you're like, you don't want to tell me what you own, do you? What? Well, people are pretty cagey with their finances, finances in general, I would think. But I, there's having a position of knowledge that's secretive is more, I'd say, more fun than anything. Or just like, hey, I know something you don't know. But sharing it and then seeing, for me, sharing that and seeing someone win as well, like, mm -hmm. I like that. Well, and if anything... The opposite would be true. I'd want to tell you because if you go and buy it and enough other people go and buy it, it's going to drive the price and higher. And you've been yeah. a front runner. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no. I've got one here for you. I, dollar cost averaging. Okay. And whether that is a good or a bad thing. Because I've heard theories from both. And I'd be curious about what. This is a good one. Where, right. where that is. Because I mean, there's, there's times when maybe you hit the jackpot on the low, but you went big or not. 
Great. Yeah. What's the what's the use yeah, case I mean, for dollar cost averaging? Use case or, you know, it's one I feel like is a, is a gamble if you're just doing one time, but dollar cost averaging helps to lower the feel of gambling over time. I would say. Yeah. Okay. So I guess how do we frame up the question for our listeners? So should you put all your money in at once? Yeah. Go all in at once, invest your, your 4,000, 5,000 into your IRA on one day of the year, or should you buy it throughout the year as you go? Okay. This is a good question. So the question to dump the money in all at once or spread it out over time. Yeah. I'm not really prepared. Like I haven't done enough homework to get this, but I, I think I think these ETFs, I don't think they really own Bitcoin. I think they own a representation of it. And so you're going to end up with tons of leverage. And if something goes haywire, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that end up owning a bunch of vapor. That's my concern. What's I may be mistaken. The SEC approved uh, like Bitcoin and crypto ETFs. I'm, I'm and just I'm like, not convinced that the whoa. regulators really understand what they're dealing with. And so no. if somebody can go in there and say, no, it works like this. And they just go, okay. And you have big enough donors in like a company that's putting people in place that are installing you people, the regulators. <laughs> I, I just, I, the vapor thing that you said though is real, right? Like what is the underlying value in cryptocurrency it comes down to what someone's willing is like it, what they this, believe that it's worth that's yeah. all that that's all you I got. continue to say that there is a value in the technology of blockchain sure but that's but that different Bitcoin than what, itself yeah. when people say well somebody put a lot of work into doing those calculations and it represents work and i go <laughs> look that's like saying, you know, <laughs> if, if I go if I go out into the middle of a lake with one paddle and just start digging on one side of the boat, I go in circle after circle after circle. And go, that was a whole lot of work and it was pretty meaningless. Right. So uh, you can't tell me that that work has value because it occurred. It has to be valuable work to have value. <laughs> Okay, I'm just right. you know, there. So, you go taunting, your, right? Uh, but but does blockchain represent a valuable technology? Yes, it's a great way to right. secure things. It's just it's not infallible, and I I continue to have these questions like Warren Buffett, where I go, what does it do? Mm-hmm. What what is the value other than <laughs> well, what we're going to get to in a let's second? Let's play this game. What happens when another cryptocurrency comes out? Because there's cryptocurrencies coming out all the time. What happens when one of them really catches fire? Or, you know, if it does. Okay. What what drives the price of anything? What someone's willing to pay for it. Yeah. Supply and demand. Well, and right? that's what I'm saying. Like, so what you happens? have insane demand and super low supply. The price goes radical. Okay. This is what happens with priceless art, for example. There's one, right? And a bunch of rich people decide that they, it's cool to have it. So what happens? The price goes awesome total. Yeah, if you don't know what that means, look it up. It's a great word. That's okay. a great word. That's a 10 cent. Yeah. 15 cent. Thank you. So, but yeah, the, the point, and, and you know what? I'll skip ahead. We got to come back to your dollar cost average question. Well, but, dollar cost average with Bitcoin. No. <laughs> yeah. I want to get to the, the can the, of worms the, we were the, looking What for. happens if another crypto comes out or how do you develop this exotic value? That's something we would call the bigger fool theory. One, right? <clears throat> what does that value always translate into? Regular cash. You know, like money. Well, I mean, yeah, Instead, ultimately you got to repatriate it in something you can spend, yeah, right? There's no tangibility in anything except cash. Well, and can't. Bitcoin can't defend itself, right? Like, what, what's to stop a quantum computer from coming in and co opting the entire chain if it's got that much computing horsepower? Mm, yeah. If I had one, I would. Right. And maybe I'm mistaken. Right. Like, well, you don't understand how quantum computers work. So true, right? I, I don't. So, so, really so I can be very wrong about this. And it's like, all right, well, good. Then it's more secure than I thought. But uh, nevertheless, it's like, what is it securing? Like Bitcoin secures mm, Bitcoin. Like, well, what do we need Bitcoin for? Well, we don't. I mean, if it didn't exist, then we'd have some other altcoin that, well, what is it secure? That's where I was some going with thing. this. What happens when you get another coin that becomes more popular than Bitcoin? Well, wasn't that sort of what Ethereum was? Because Ethereum right. actually secures data, right? It's a platform where you've got a blockchain that you can secure data on, not just more tokens. Right. What I understand, those are the two. And as our other brother, Brent, likes to call it Bit and ETH. Because mm-hmm. you know, those who are into it are into really it, into it. Full word, because who wouldn't want to waste their time? Doing that? Yeah, it's exhausting to say the whole thing. But I'd like to table 
Ethan bit, if that's okay. Because I really am curious about this dollar cost average question okay. we were going at in the last second. All right. Well, the dollar cost. So, j just reminder to everybody listening. So, the dollar cost average question was: Should you or shouldn't you? Right. Mm -hmm. And and think of it this way: Hey, you're going to make. Uh, do you do a lump sum investment today and just plunk all your money into the market and get it over with, or do you spread it out over time and put a little bit in several times over weeks or months? It's, and so that you ultimately get everything in to the market, but it takes you a period of time to do it. Okay. Pros and cons to it. Okay. Let's talk about one that rarely gets talked about. Are there transaction charges? Sometimes. Right. If there are, then you have to consider what is the price of multiplying the number of transactions. Oh, I went from one time. It, we, we often refer, refer to these as ticket charges, right? So the ticket, like I did one ticket, so I paid one charge. I did 12 tickets, so I paid 12 charges, okay? Is the ticket charge standard, like a flat ticket regardless of size, right? Oh, I could buy a million shares of something. I can buy one share of something, same ticket price. Right. Okay, because that's usually an administrative fee that's being charged for the record keeping and just the system operating, okay? Mm -hmm. Well... It really depends on how much money you're investing. It does depend right? on the because size of the if transaction. If I'm trying to put $100 into the stock market, I don't And it's a $5 order. So you yeah. don't want to pay 5% of the yeah. transaction as a fee right? and do that five times. a dozen times. Yeah. It's like, so well, you I put you know, $1,200 in and I spent $60 to do it. It's like that was an expensive way to get the money into the market. Mm -hmm. right? If I make 10%, I make $120. I, half my... Mm -hmm return went to fees that year. Right. But if you run it the other way, I got $2 million to invest. Well, if you put all 2 million in at once and then the market moves 10% lower, you yes. probably should have dollar cost averaged in. So the, the question is, why are you dollar cost averaging? And here's what I will tell you about dollar cost averaging that I just don't think it's talked about much. One, it's diminishing in value. Meaning the bigger your account gets, if you're already in, like if you got a million dollar account and you're putting $500 a month in, dollar cost averaging the $500 a month does very little. Right. Because you got a million dollars here and the percentage of assets you're averaging into it proportionate to what's already in there, it, it, it just can't move the needle enough, right? The, the joke is it's like peeing in the ocean. At some point you go, well, it's, it's going to get diluted so much you're not going to notice. Okay? So – my well, man's laughing at that. But peeing in, but the, it, but, peeing in the kiddie pool is a little yeah, different. Yeah, peeing in the bathtub, you might notice, right? You're like, wait a second, that that's a the concentration level is different. You so know, I come up with an aircraft carrier. He comes up with peeing in the bathtub. in the ocean. <laughs> welcome yes. to welcome to the mind of David Littlejohn. Yeah, you're welcome. All of the examples actually really good. <laughs> <laughs> so so what happens is statistically speaking. There's not a huge discernible difference. Uh, in fact, you oftentimes, especially like beginning of a year, it, it's it's random as to when you do this. But typically speaking, 12 months later, you'd have probably made more money if you just plunked the money in all at once and got it over with. Okay. The question is, can you stomach that? Because if you do that and then the market, like if you did that at the beginning of 2022, oh, yeah. and then the markets drop by 15 to 20%, you know, oh, I put $100,000 in, now I have 80. And it flips people out. So it can it can be so emotionally jarring if you're not sort of resolute that you change your strategy and then you start making bad decisions after that and it compounds the losses as opposed to just saying, well, that's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Five years from now, it'll all be history and you move forward, right? And some people are very good at that too. But it also depends on your age and how soon you need the money. That's a big one, right? Yeah. So therein lies the, the quandary is that Academically speaking, you oftentimes make the most money by just dumping the money in and getting it to work faster. But it, it is a higher risk trade off. So it's not that it's a yes or no answer. You do one or the other. The question is, what's your risk tolerance and what's appropriate yeah. for you? And what's going to let you sleep at night? Yeah. Well, and this is why it helps to get someone who knows what they're doing to explain these things to you as an education, not necessarily a sale or anything like that it's yeah. just understanding you because it's all personal mm -hmm. all this is personal yeah you know your risk tolerance mine is not matt's it's definitely not Ooh. david's you know 
I, way higher. Yeah, way higher. No, I, I drive 90 everywhere I go. I yeah, kilometers. Go. Well, kilometers. Yeah. Kilometers. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, everybody uses <laughs> kilometers, right? That's what radar detectors are for. Yeah. Which yeah. kilometers is that's like 55, just so we're clear. But I, I think both, all of those points are very good. Um, yeah. The way how you take it, you lump sum, or if you're going to pay to chip in over time, uh, one year to year could be. Yeah. Different than the other well, uh, here's the other thing that is sort of lost. It doesn't have to be all at once. See, like you don't have to break it into even amounts. So you said, "Well, we're gonna put fifty percent in right now, and then we're gonna put a little bit more in a little bit later." So, yeah. yeah. Or you could get a leg cramp. Like I just got. Oh, fun! <laughs> we we'll just looked over. He's got this strained look on his face. Like, <laughs> did you just get shot? <laughs> this is the best part of your show, right? No, it's not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Trying since New Year's, and I just got part of it from this chair. Oh. <laughs> All right, and he's going to be standing up. Where we have been talking about uh, some of the, uh, we'll call them controversial theories or conspiracies around the internet, or, or maybe they're just uh, questions that need better explanations. Theories about the stock market. Right, theories about the stock market. And there's a few of them. Um, you know, we talked about the theory of uh, the efficient market hypothesis, actually, mm -hmm. is what it's called. Uh, we talked about the bigger fool theory. That's the simple idea that, you know, it doesn't matter what you pay for it as long as there's a bigger fool that will buy it from you for more, right? Mm -hmm. That was 2008 housing market, by the way. Right? Uh, we've talked about, we had a conversation about dollar cost averaging, actually, which is not, the, the, but the theory of, like, is there a benefit to it, right? And we talked about the use case of that. So, uh there are, you know, what are some other things that we should, one of them I'd like to talk about this because this one, it comes up a lot is, um, should you simply buy an index and hold it and not uh, do anything else, right? Like, is there a place for active investing? What is the role the advisor has? Now, I'm going to also disclose right out of the gate, kind of a conflicted position to start with, because as an advisor that people hire and they do pay us, hey, some of this you know, it, it's like, am I giving advice that's going to be beneficial for yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, am I trying to make the advisor look good and justify it? Or am I trying to just be real honest about that? I'm going to attempt to be real honest and come right at this thing, okay? Because first and foremost, my theory on the advisor is the value added is not just directly an investment performance. In fact, seldom is it investment performance where the value is added, right? I think the value is added in in help with decision making, managing the the legal complexities or the tax complexities around what you're doing, and somebody will do it for you. And oftentimes it's, you know, just a deal of talking to people out of making a really bad decision. Yeah, sometimes it is exactly that, right? It's protection from oneself because when you are the same reason, I believe that they say medical professionals can't operate on their family. Mm -hmm. Right, you're too close to it. You're emotionally compromised, and you can start to make decisions that are not professionally sound decisions because you're compromised going into it. Right, where the advisor has some professional distance, if you will. Right, that that clinical distance that that comes with being trained, and and so I think that's important. What I think that is for those who haven't had a get burned type moment yet it's a lot easier to say, oh, I'm just floating through this, no problem. But until you do, um, and you realize the pain that that can cause, not only just in your financial life, but maybe in your personal life, your family life, mm -hmm. your spousal life, yeah. those things are, in my opinion, not worth the cost of taking on that type of risk on your own. Mm -hmm. When you have someone else who's helping you get through these decisions, while they are all personal, that person is your advocate in this and is is Lord willing in a, in a position, and I know that Dave does this with, with his clients that I know, is, is looking out for your best interest. And whether you think you're making a good decision or not, having someone take you through that uh, to understand both pros and cons and make an informed decision that you feel good about your choice at the end of that talk, I think it's worth every penny. I really do. Yeah, I just, didn't actually put him up to that, but thanks. Like pitch, <laughs> I'm just saying from personal experience, yeah. Uh, I, when you're same, in it, conflict in yeah, this. it's hard. It's like if the house is on fire and the baby's in there, you know, you run in there and you kind of re react emotionally, and you, you you can actually put 
two people in danger, right? Versus having the right uh, tools and resources to save everybody, right? And that's like the firefighters better equipped than you are. Well, and also what you said, someone to actually do it. Yeah, to, I always say to, like, to, I, I don't change my own oil, not because I don't know how. But because you might let it go to 20,000 miles before you get around to doing it. Pushing the buy button on Robin Hood is stressful. Yeah, it's well. It's not just I mean, it's, right. and the oil yeah. change. It's like somebody else has all of the tools, the ability to do a lot of the things that are messy and time consuming, and so they can get rid of it easier than you can. Right. Yeah. It's literally like the oil disposal. People just don't value their time in the equation. Mm -hmm. Like I changed my oil because that's what a man does, or a woman, or whatever. And I'm like, um, I don't change my own oil not because I can't, but because I am way money ahead to have somebody else do that and be in and out quickly, know that it's done, have it tracked. It goes in the Carfax if I ever want to sell it. Like all of that history is recorded and everything stays tidy. And I'm like, that is so much easier than me going and dealing with all of it because I just don't have the facilities and resources to pull it off that right. easy. So you hire it done because it's bad. And then you know what? I go spend time doing what I do well. So it's, it's trading time on purpose. Skiing. 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 Well, skiing. You have to do yeah. <laughs> that. And the older I get, the less I do skiing well. well. I was a joke on the break. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's missing a ski day possibly to work. So ah. I, I know. I'll what? back Can you, you up, imagine? Scott. I'll back you up. I'll force him out of the office for you. Ah. <laughs> One day this is... Hey, I do love skiing, but uh, you know what? We all have our obligations. So what do you do? Exactly. <laughs> but you uh, love skiing more. <laughs> yeah. Now, in the last few minutes, let's just talk about indexes for a second. The S&P 500 is usually the common benchmark. And people will say academically, it's very difficult to outperform the S&P 500. That is true. Right? It's actually very difficult to outperform the S&P 500 by the very nature of how it's built. The bigger companies that are growing and getting bigger and that money's flowing into continue to become a heavier weighting in that index. So it's basically reformulating to the winners all the time. That's a really good academic strategy. However, it doesn't control volatility and it's becoming more and more concentrated. And so it looks different than it did 10 years ago when the diversification was broader and less sector focused. It's much more heavily weighted in large tech companies than it ever has been right now. Can you give just a brief, short definition of what the S&P actually is? Yeah. How is it made up? The 500 largest domestic companies by market cap. So market cap meaning the value, if you add it up, all the shares of stock in existence at the price per share, that's the total amount of stock value in the company. So capitalization or how, what it is valued at based on the share price and the number of shares outstanding. And it's the 500 largest domestic company. So it's here in the United States. There's more than 500 stocks in the S&P 500 because some of the companies have multiple share classes. Like Google has two different share classes, A shares and B shares. They're both in the S&P 500. So it has like 506 companies, stock set tickers in it, but it's the 500 largest domestic companies. And so someone investing in this, how, what happens? So you can't invest directly in an index. You have to buy it through an index fund or an exchange traded fund. So somebody has packaged them up in a group and you're buying the package from them. Would an advisor do some of that with them? Is it like, just depending on the person? You could, yeah, advi yeah. We buy the S&P 500 for our clients. We just typically buy it with other stuff too because rarely is somebody just a pure stock investor with no consideration for risk. And so the S&P is part of the equation, but it's not the whole equation. Right. And so therein lies. And, and really, this is probably a good serve up topic for a future show, which is understanding back to the efficient markets. Where do you put money in different areas? Because like, yeah, we're not time to go into it. But you have to buy. Yeah, to like how many stocks and like, you know, what about investing overseas and so forth? Or is it efficient there and whatnot? So they're not all created equal. And we are always trying to figure that out. But to be real honest, we're out of time for today. So uh, they're gonna, the music's going to start playing. They're going to kick us off. So here's what we do. If you got more questions, Matt, how do they find us? Give us a call, 541-375-0898, or shoot us an email, info at littlejohnfs.com. Scott, free flug for your business. If you're looking for uh, help with the Medicare or health insurance out there, it's Little John Insurance. 
541-844-3434. All right. And that's it for today. We got to run. So until next time, thanks for joining us. I'm Dave Littlejohn. Matt Dixon. Scott and you've been listening to the True Off on News Radio 93.9 FM at 1240 KQEN.